Hope you are well in the Lord today. In this video, we want to start going through the law of Christ. Uh, a lot of people are not even aware that Jesus Christ gave us a law. A lot of people think that the Old Testament was law, the New Testament is grace. But when we look at the scriptures more carefully, we understand that Jesus Christ indeed gave us a law. In fact, he told us uh, to go make disciples, baptizing them, and then teaching them to obey all that he commanded. So a lot of times, because of different traditions, we have not understood this clearly. And since we don't understand it clearly, since we don't understand that there is a law, we oftentimes don't know what that law consists of. We don't focus on what his commands are. We don't understand how it relates with the Old Testament. And so in this series, we want to go through, I'm just going to take, a, uh, take time to walk through some issues. Uh, so this might be several videos. I don't know exactly how many videos this will be. Uh, I'll probably try to make n no video longer than one hour. And so I'll probably try to wrap it up whenever we get to an hour for each video. But I'm not going to skip over things. We've already touched on the law of Christ in, in another series. We talked about the Old Testament law and how it's been fulfilled by the law of Christ. But in this one, I want to go through in depth and we want to look at a lot of different issues and look at the passages that are related to them. And so if you are interested in understanding what the law of Christ is and why is it that we're not under the Old Testament law, but we are under a law in the New Testament, then go ahead and join with me in this study. Now, I'm going to kind of cover three main areas over this entire series. It's going to be one, we're going to focus in on what the law of Christ is, what he actually taught, what his commandments are. Uh, the second one, we're going to look at how does the Old Testament and the New Testament law compare? Uh, how do they relate with one another? How does the New Testament law fulfill the Old Testament law? And then finally, we're going to look at why is it that we are not under the Old Testament law? Why is it that we're not under the laws of Israel, but we're under the laws of Christ? And so let's go ahead and jump over to a familiar passage. If you've been coming to this channel very often, yeah, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we'll start in verse uh, 19. In verse 19, we see this. This is Paul speaking about his, uh, his principle by which he would go share the gospel with different people. In this context, he's going to be talking about sharing the gospel with Jews, with Gentiles, and then also how he relates with the church of God, the people that are Christians, but they're weak in their faith and they struggle with uh, the liberty that we have in Christ. And so he's going to talk about how he limits his freedom on many, in many situations in order to be a blessing to others so that they will not stumble. And so he starts here in verse 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win even more. Verse 20. To the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. So here he says, as under the law. So when he's among the Jews, he goes, he, he keeps the dietary laws. He keeps other laws. We see this whenever he went to Jerusalem towards the end of his ministry when he was arrested and then sent to Rome. We see that he went and he even paid for somebody to do a Nazarite vow. And so we see that he was not opposed to keeping the law of Moses. He just didn't require it. He didn't, uh, he knew that we were no longer under that law and he didn't himself keep it as he's going to say when he went among the Gentiles. But when he was among the Jews, he would make sure that he didn't cause offense. He would uh, not cause them to stumble, but he would uh, keep the aspects of the law. Uh, that would help those Jews be able to accept the message. For example, if he was going to uh, minister to Jews and he was eating dinner with them, then he would not be trying to reach for a pork sandwich at the same time he was trying to uh, minister the gospel to them. So to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win the Jews to those who are under the law as under the law. And then some versions, if you have a newer version like NIV or uh, ESV, it will say, though I myself am not under the law. So it's very clear that he was, he was acting as though he was under the law, but he was not under the law of Moses, that I might win those who are under the law. Verse 21, to those who are outside the law, as outside the law, being not without God's law, but under Christ's law, that I might win those who are outside the law. So who are those outside the law? The Gentiles. They are not under the law of Moses. They were never under the law of Moses unless they joined with Israel and they were circumcised and joined into the old covenant. And so the Gentiles, they were outside the law. And so whenever Paul was among them, he would live like he was not a Jew. So he wouldn't go to a family's house, but he would go and, and, and begin to eat with them and say, no, no, I can't eat that. I'm not going to eat that. As we're told in 
uh, Romans chapter 14, that we should eat whatever is set before us. If an unbeliever asks us to come, this was written to uh, a Roman believers, so they were among Gentiles. It says, look, if you're among, uh, if you're among the Gentiles and somebody asks you, an unbeliever asks you to come and eat, go ahead and eat whatever is set before you without asking any questions. Now, in that issue, in Romans chapter 14, it's talking about whether you eat food sacrificed to idols. So it says, look, don't ask. Just, just leave it alone. If they don't tell you that it's sacrificed to idols, don't worry about it. But we note there that they were able to go and eat with unbelievers, and they were able to eat what was set before them, as it says in Romans chapter 14. And so Paul, when he was in that situation, when he was among Gentiles, he would eat as the Gentiles did. He wouldn't stump, cause them to stumble by saying, no, no, I can't eat your food. Your, your food is unclean. He wouldn't do that. But instead... To those who are outside the law as outside the law being not without god's law but under christ's law so though he was not under the law of moses and though when he was among the gentiles he would live as though he's not under the law of moses that didn't mean he was without law he was under the law of god which is the law of jesus christ the commands and the teachings of jesus christ what he commanded us we are obligated to obey we are under the law that's what it means to be under to be under the law of moses means to be obligated to obey it to be under the law of christ means that we are obligated to obey it so he just wants to make it clear though i am outside the law of Moses, I'm not outside the law of God, which is Christ's law. Now for context, verse 22, to the weak, this is to the weak believers that uh, struggle with, you know, uh, maybe they don't know that they can eat everything, they don't understand the liberty we have in Christ. Verse 22, to the weak I became as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And so some of the believers, uh, some of the believers were, uh, struggling they didn't think that they could eat it and if they did eat it then their conscience was seared and then that would cause them to sin against Christ and so Paul here is saying that look I'm not gonna be a stumbling block for my brother but I'm going to limit myself so that I can win them so that I can continue to lead them in the right way in Christ and so that's the context of the passage but what we want to focus on here is that Paul was under law not the law of Moses but he was under God's law which is the law of Christ we see the law of Christ mentioned again if we flip over to Galatians chapter 6. And we start to get an idea about what that law consists of. In chapter 6, starting in verse 1. But brothers, if a man is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, watching yourselves, lest you also be tempted. Verse 2. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So if we bear one another's burdens, that is, if we walk in love with our brethren, then we are fulfilling the law of Jesus Christ. And so here it's very clear, the law of Christ is something that we must walk in, we must fulfill. As I mentioned before, a lot of times people think of the Old Testament as law and the New Testament as grace. But actually we're under the grace of God so that we receive the Spirit of God so that then we can walk in God's holy law, the law of Jesus Christ, what he gives us and commands us. We see in Matthew, whenever Jesus comes and it says that he goes up and he sits on the mountain and then he begins to speak. And what he says, uh, everything he refers to is from the Old Testament law. He says, you've heard it said, do not commit murder. That's from the Ten Commandments. Do not commit adultery. And he, he goes through different things that are in the law and he says, you've heard it said, You've heard it written in the Old Testament law like this, but I say to you, uh, for example, he'll say, you know, you've heard it said in the Old Testament law that if you swear, keep the oaths that you make to the Lord. But I say to you, don't swear at all, either by heaven or by earth. Uh, and he goes on and says, anything more than your yes and yes and no, meaning no, is of the evil one. And so he begins to tell us God's righteous standard, his eternal standard. The Old Testament law was only that picture, and he's coming and saying, I'm telling you the righteous standard of the law. And so he wasn't opposing it. He wasn't saying, no, all of the Old Testament law, law is wrong. It's not from God. No, he's saying, I came to fulfill this law, and so my teaching fulfills it. And so when he came down from the mountain, the, the Bible says that the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one with authority. Because what happened is he went up on this mountain, he sat there, and then he gave his law. He gave the commands of God to the people of God. Now, this is significant because in the Old Testament, this is a picture. In other words, Jesus is becoming the fulfillment of what Moses was a type of. 
So in the Old Testament, Moses went up to the the mountain and he received from God a law and he brought it down, written by the the finger of God and gave it to the people and then continued to give other things that were in the law from God to the people. But here we see Jesus Christ himself going up, sitting on the mountain and he is the Lord, he is Yahweh and he is giving his law. He is speaking with authority because he is the king, he is the Messiah. And so we need to understand that the New Testament is not opposed to the law, but we believe in the law of Christ, which is the fulfillment of the law. The Old Testament was only a type and a shadow, and what came through Moses was only a picture. What we see in Jesus Christ and the law that we have through Jesus Christ is the eternal law of God. It is God's law. Let's go ahead and turn over to John. John chapter 15. Now, John chapter 15... Uh, Starting in verse 1 is the parable of the vine and the the branches. So Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. If you uh, don't abide in me and you don't bear fruit, then you'll be cut off and cast into the fire. And so he's saying that salvation is through a relationship, a covenant with him, that we walk with him day by day, that we can't separate ourselves from Jesus and imagine that we still have the life that is found in him. No, just like a branch must be connected to the vine in order to remain, bear fruit and remain alive. If not, it's good for nothing but to be burned because once it's broken off of the tree, then it is no longer, uh, it's no longer alive. It's no longer useful in the same way. If we turn away from Christ, then we are no longer walking in the life that is in him. The Bible says that God has given us life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life and he who does not have the son of God does not have life. So we must walk in a relationship and a covenant with Jesus Christ. And so he goes on in verse nine, as the father loved me, I also loved you remain in my love. So we're supposed to abide in Jesus Christ. How do we do this? Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love even as I have kept my father's commandments and remain in his love. So Jesus gave commandments and we are to obey them. He is the Lord. In order to be saved, it says that we must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. And so we must confess he is Lord. That means we believe he is the Lord. He has all authority in heaven and earth and we must obey his commands. Uh, Jesus said in John chap- or Luke chapter 6, 46, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? And so we understand that Jesus Christ gave commands and we are obligated to obey them. This doesn't mean that we are supposed to obey them perfectly. No, the parable itself talks about God pruning us so that we can bear more fruit. So it doesn't mean that we walk in perfection, but it does mean that Christians are not rebellious, but they walk in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, to his commands. This is the law of Christ, the commands of Jesus Christ. Let's go to John chapter 14, flip back a little bit, because Jesus had already been talking about this. If we look here in verse, let's start in verse 12. See, John 14, verse 12. No, not 12. Starting verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. So if somebody says that they love him, then they will keep his commandments. This is what we are called to do. I will pray for the Father and he will give you another counselor, uh, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him. It goes on, jump over to verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and will reveal myself to him. So if we say that we love the Lord Jesus Christ, then we must keep his commandments. Uh, The Bible says that he is coming to bring salvation for those that are waiting for him, for those that love him. He's promised eternal life to those that love him. And so we must love the Lord. The Bible says, let him who does not love the Lord Jesus Christ be a curse. Paul said that I believe in 2 Corinthians. So verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. Verse, uh, jump over to verse 23. If a man loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. The word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. So the word of the father is being spoken by Jesus Christ. He is the one that is bringing the words of God, the commands of God. And so as he brings the word of God, then we understand that these are the commands that we are required. This is the law of God. If somebody says they love God, but they don't obey Jesus Christ, they do not love him. They are rejecting his words. This is what Jesus teaches us right here. Now let's jump over to uh, 1 John. It's going to be a a different book than the Gospel of John, but it's going to be the same author. So we're going to read here in 1 John. 
Let's look at... Uh, let's see. Okay, let's go ahead and look at at 1 John chapter 3. Makes an important statement here and tells us what sin is. Verse 4, whoever practices sin breaks the law for sin is lawlessness. So this is not an Old Testament book. This is not writing uh, to us and telling us to keep the law of Moses. Of course, it's talking about the law of Jesus Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, as we also read in Galatians chapter uh, 6. So we see that this is the law of Christ, and this is the, the, the law of God. And so it says, whoever practices sin breaks the law, for sin is lawlessness. So sin is breaking God's law. It's transgression of the law. You know that he was revealed to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever remains in him does not sin. Whoever sins has not seen him and does not know him. We need to understand that the, in, in the Christian life, we are required to walk in obedience to Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that uh, the, the, the New Testament doesn't teach that, well, just because we believed in Jesus Christ one time, now we have eternal life, we're justified forever, and there's no way we can lose our salvation. And so since it's all done, then now obedience is optional. No, we, salvation is conditional on us remaining in Jesus Christ, remaining in the vine. And how do we remain in the vine? We obey his commandments. And so the idea that the Christian life is lawless, the idea that there is no law in the Christian life and that there is no uh, res responsibility for us to obey, that there are no co eternal consequences if we refuse to submit to Jesus Christ, this is a dangerous teaching. It's lawlessness and it is not true. Now, it, it's interesting that this verse, whoever practices sin breaks the law for sin is lawlessness. It's interesting that both those that are in the so-called free grace camp and those that are in the Hebraic roots camp, these two errors, they will both use this verse. Now, those in the free grace camp will say this. Look, if someone is practicing sin, that means they're breaking the law of Moses. And so to call somebody to repent of their sin, to be saved, is calling them to be saved by turning back and obeying the law of Moses. And so this is why those in the free grace camp will say, no, we don't have to call people to repentance. People don't have to repent to be saved. They just have to believe that Jesus died for them and rose again. There's no repentance required. And they'll say that if you call somebody to repentance for salvation, you're calling them to earn their salvation through obeying the law of Moses. And they will go to this passage here to uh, confirm that. The same thing will be done except in an opposite fashion by those in the Hebraic roots camp. They will also say whoever practices sin breaks the law of Moses. So for sin is breaking uh, uh, Moses' law. And so they will say that, so if we want to turn back to God and live in obedience to him as Jesus Christ commands that we do, we must obey the law of Moses. But it's very important that we understand from the book of John and then from 1 John here that there is nothing that talks anything about the law of Moses. This is in the new covenant, and so it's talking about the law of Christ. We are not, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, we are not under the law, but we are uh, the law of Moses, but we are under the law of Jesus Christ, the law of God. And so this is the law that is being spoken spoken about. And this is very important for us to get this, this key, key point. Because in Scripture, in the New Testament, what they are usually arguing against are either the Judaizers, those that say we need to continue as believers in Jesus, continue to obey the laws of Moses, or they are, uh, Paul is often talking against those that believe that they can live and walk according to the flesh, live in sin, and there will be no eternal consequences, the lawless people. Okay, And so this is an error, and the error is this. If we say that Christians have no law, then we are lawless. And so we fall on the side of those in the free grace camp, that there's no law that is obligated upon us and that is going to affect our eternal destiny. We can obey it or disobey it. Either way, we're still going to heaven because we believed. Okay, so that is the lawless camp. And then there's the other side that says, no, no, we're under grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can obey God's law and the law that we are to obey is the law of Moses. And this is going to be those in the Hebraic roots camp. And so in Galatians chapter 1 through uh, chapter 4, Paul is going to be arguing against those in the Judaizer camp, those in the Hebraic roots camp. But then in verses chapter 5 and 6 of Galatians, he's going to be arguing against those that don't know that if you sow to the, the flesh, you will reap corruption. 
but if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life. Those that don't understand that there is a law that must be obeyed and there are consequences with that law. So we need to understand when we come to the New Testament and it talks about law, we need to understand what is being dis discussed. If we're required to obey it, it's going to be the law of Jesus Christ. And whenever it talks about uh, not being justified through the law, it often will connect that with circumcision and with other uh with other things that are in the law of Moses, but not in the law of Jesus Christ. So I just want us to be clear on that principle. Christians are under the law. They are under the law of Christ. They are not under the law of Moses. And they are not lawless, as many would have us to believe. As we go on in this passage, okay, so verse 6, Whoever remains in him does not sin. Whoever sins has not seen him and does not know him. Christians don't continue to practice sin. This is why it tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you do not sin. But this doesn't mean perfection because it goes on to say, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So we see that uh, whenever the Bible and, and 1 John in particular says that the, the believer doesn't sin, it means that this is not the practice of his way of life. If we do sin, that doesn't mean we're immediately cut off from God. We have an advocate with the Father. And so we have to also have this balance between an idea of perfectionism and this idea that we are lawless. So some people will say, no, a Christian never sins. If you sin, you're cut off from Christ, and then you need to be saved again. You need to get back reconciled to God. If you die in that situation, then you're going to go to hell. This is false, according to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. But then on the other hand, others will say, well, since nobody can be perfect, then God doesn't have any standards of obedience. And uh, so since we can't obey perfectly, it's not, it's not required for our eternal salvation that we obey at all. That is also not true because Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9 says he is the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And so obedience is required. Perfection is not required. And so God does not accept rebellion, but he does not expect perfection. And so we see that. So in verse 7, chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does righteousness is righteous just as Christ is righteous. So it's not just a matter of I believed and now I have Christ's righteousness and then whatever happens now, I'm already perfectly right in God's eyes. No, we're perfectly right in God's eyes as we abide in Christ, keeping his commands, not perfectly, but in an obedient, submissive spirit, submitting to him as Lord. As we walk in covenant fellowship with him, trusting him, walking with him. Uh, he is our Lord and we are to submit to him. We love him if we obey his commandments. If we do not love him, we do not obey his commandments. And so salvation is for those that love Jesus Christ, that cling to him. Uh, Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 27, he says, the father himself loves you because, there's a reason God loves us, because you have loved me and you have believed that God has sent me. And so uh, we are called to love the Lord Jesus Christ in a love relationship with him. We trust in him. We submit to him. We obey him. So the one who does righteousness is righteous. That is the one that walks with Jesus Christ, submitting to him, not in perfection, but submitting to him, obeying his commands is in right relationship with God and counted righteous in God's eyes. Don't let anybody deceive you, it says. Don't let anybody tell you that as long as you believe the right concepts or believe the right historical facts about Jesus, that you are perfectly right in God's eyes and he doesn't see any of your sin. That is not true. We are going to be judged according to our works on the day of judgment. The Bible is clear. We don't earn our salvation by, uh, by our works, but it is a condition that we walk in submission to Jesus Christ and not rebellion to him. Uh, let's go ahead and keep our finger here. Let's go ahead and jump. Because in this series, we don't want to rush through things. So let's go ahead and jump back to Psalm chapter 2. And look here about what it prophesies about this new covenant. Verse, chapter, verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves against the rulers, uh, take, and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed. That is against his Christ, the, his king. Saying, let us tear off their bonds and cast away their ropes from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs and the Lord ridicules them. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his burning anger. So we need to understand, first of all, that God is the same in the Old Testament as in the New. He hates wickedness and loves righteousness. Okay, that is true. Jesus came just not just to forgive us of our sins, but he came to wash us clean. Keeping your finger here in, in Psalm 2, that's why we read in 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, you know that he was revealed to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. 
whoever remains in him does not sin. So he came not just to forgive us of our past sins, but then to set us free by the power of God because Jesus said whoever sins is a slave to sin and a slave will not enter into the Father's house. But if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Free from what? Free from the power and bondage of sin so that we can walk in obedience to Jesus Christ. If we fall, we have an advocate with the Father, we have a throne of grace that we can go to, but we have the Spirit of God and we can walk in God's righteousness. So flipping back again to Psalm chapter 2 with your finger stayed in... 1 John 3, I encourage you as we go through this that you have your Bible out and you really, uh, you know, go through these passages and, and see what actually the text is saying. So in verse 6, God says to them in his anger, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will declare the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. And this day I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. He has all authority in heaven and earth. He is the son of God risen from the dead and he is the king of all. Verse 9, you will break them with a scepter of iron. You will dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Right now Jesus rules over the kings of the earth. He is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. Now then you kings be wise, be admonished you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, tremble with trepidation. Kiss the sun. Kiss the sun means come and bow and pay homage to him. Kiss his feet. Okay? Kiss the sun lest he become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath kindles in a flash. Blessed are all who seek refuge in him. That is, blessed are all who abide in the vine, who seek refuge in Jesus Christ, who cling to him for salvation, who don't stray from him, who don't run from him, who don't shrink back from the faith, but they hold their confidence firm unto the end. If we hold to him, blessed are all who take refuge in him because he is a refuge for those that trust in him. But woe to those that refuse to come and pay homage to the son and bow before him as Lord. We must confess Jesus as Lord. So going back to uh, 1 John chapter 3, Verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does righteousness is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. Whoever practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was revealed that he might destroy the works of the devil. Okay, who is it that is righteous? Those that practice righteousness. Those that don't walk in rebellion and lawlessness and sin against the Lord, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, they walk in obedience. Whoever practices sin, verse 8, is of the devil, okay, because he has been sinning from the beginning. But in Jesus there is no sin, and whoever is in Jesus does not continue to live in habitual sin. Verse 9, whoever has been born of God does not practice sin, for his seed remains in him. Now, there is a strange teaching out there, especially those in the, the so-called free grace camp, and they will teach that when we're born again, it's not us that's born again. It's not that we become the children of God, but somehow we are born again only in our spirit. That our soul is kind of in the middle, and then we have a flesh that is completely uh, unsanctified in every way. And so when the spirit is born again, the spirit will never sin again. And so they will take this very, uh, very woodenly. They will say, whoever has been born of God does not sin, okay? And he cannot keep on, he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Okay? And so they'll say, look, so our new nature, the spirit, our new born again nature cannot sin. Now the Bible tells us that there are sins not only, that we need to cleanse ourselves not only of sins. Let's go ahead and turn to, let's see, I believe it's in, let me check here. So with your finger stayed in 1 John chapter 3, let's look over to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Okay, now it talks about not being unequally yoked with unbelievers, don't fellowship with unrighteousness, uh, starting and then verse 15, what agreement has Christ and Belial? Or what part has he who believes with an unbeliever? Verse 16, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. So we are the temple of the living God. The spirit of God dwells within us. We're born again, not because our spirit is just born again. We're born again because we become the children of God. We receive his spirit within us that cries out, Abba, Father. We are the children of God. And one day, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 23, that we are waiting for the hope when our bodies will be raised from the dead and we will receive the redemption of our bodies, our adoption as sons. So our physical bodies are also going to be completely redeemed. And so all salvation includes every part of us. It's not just our spirit and our soul is in the middle and then there, our flesh is just untouched. No, we're not Gnostics. We believe that Jesus Christ came to save us, that he's the creator 
of the flesh, the body uh, as well. So, for you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, so these promises that if we will come out and we will walk with the Lord, then we will be his sons and daughters. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness and the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We perfect holiness in the fear of God, cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. Okay, so there's not only sins of the flesh like adultery. There's also sins of the spirit, spirit like sorcery, like greed, uh, uh, the things that are within inside of us that are spiritual of nature. That we can also sin in spirit, not just in flesh. So that's just a, a side tangent that we make sure that we understand what the scripture is saying here in First John chapter three. So it says, so my translation uh, is not a wooden literal translation, so it adds a little bit of, of help for us to understand the context. So verse 8, whoever practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was revealed that he might destroy the works of the devil, which is sin. Whoever has been born of God does not practice sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Since we are children of God, it's not natural for us with the Spirit of God working in us, convicting us, working in us uh, to do and to will according to his good pleasure. It's not natural for us to go back to the vomit and to walk in sin. No, if the seed of God remains in us, his word, his spirit is inside of us, then we should walk according to the spirit, not according to the flesh. This doesn't mean that it's impossible for us to sin, as those in the free grace camp would say that it's impossible for our born again spirits to sin. That is not true, because it doesn't, it goes on here in verse 10. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are revealed. It doesn't say the spirits of the children of God and the spirits of the children of the devil. It says, in this, the children of God, us, that have been born again by God's Spirit, that are new creatures in Jesus Christ. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are revealed. Whoever does not live in righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Okay? In the Christian life, we, when we're born again, what does it mean that we're born again? It means that we have gone from death to life, we've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Jesus Christ, that we were once dead in our sins and trespasses, now we've been raised up with Jesus Christ, that we're in a new position with Jesus Christ, we're in a new relationship with him, God is now dwelling within us, we're no longer alienated from God, our lives have changed, we have turned away from rebellion, and now we are walking as children of the light, submitting to Jesus Christ in all righteousness and in truth, and so being born again is not just something that happens to our spirit or happens to our soul. It's not just something. It's a, a complete transformation of who we are in our relationship with God, in our walk with other people, in our walk in this world. And so that's why it says here, whoever does not live in righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So whenever we're born again, then we should love God, we should love our neighbor, and we should love the brethren. So it's very clear here that Christians are to walk in righteousness. If they are not walking in righteousness, again, this is not perfection. This is not perfectionism. But we're walking and clinging to Jesus Christ through faith, a living faith that works through love, as it says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. Okay, so we see that here. Now, it's, ta it's starting to give us some clues here about what the law, what the commands are. It says, whoever does not live in righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother because that would be walking in righteousness. If we flip back to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, we're trying to, at this point, we're trying to nail down that indeed in the new, new covenant, there is a law that we are supposed to obey, that Christians are expected to obey Jesus Christ, not just uh, believe in him, but believe in him with a faith that works through love. And so if we go back to chapter two, and we start again in verse one. We already looked at this. Let's look again. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you do not sin because the Christian life, you're not supposed to walk in sin and rebellion. But if anyone does sin, that is, if we stumble, if we transgress against God, then we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so we have a throne of grace to go to when we fall. But if we fall and we say, hey, I really like this, you know, 
this mud puddle here and I'm just going to swim in it for a, lot, a while, then our hearts are going to be hardened and we're going to end up turning away from the living gods. It says in Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. So we need to, in order to not let our faith become dead, we need to not give way to sin, not let it harden our hearts and turn us away from God. Verse 3, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now I want us to see this transition here very clearly. In verse 1, it said, I'm writing these things so, you, so that you do not sin, okay? But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Now, let me go ahead and harp a little bit again on that Gnostic interpretation of 1 John chapter 3, that they cannot sin. Here, he's talking to my little children. Those, these are the children of God. These are believers. And he says, I'm writing to, these, to you so that you do not sin, okay? This was the will of God for them. But if anyone does sin, well, wait a second, how did they sin? They sin... They are the ones that are sinning. They are, it's not just their spirit, it's not just their body, but they are the ones that are sinning against God and they are the ones that are commanded not to sin. So we see that he says, okay, don't sin. If you do sin, we have an advocate. So it's not talking about perfection. But then he says in verse three, by this we know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Okay, so what does it mean that uh, we know him? Well, Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 3, that this is eternal life, to know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. Jesus said I, in John, John uh, 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Eternal life is coming back to the Father. Eternal life is not going to heaven. Eternal life is coming back to the Father. This is why at the end of the book, it says that God is going to come and dwell among men on a new uh, recreated heaven and earth. And so he's going to live here among men. And so eternal life is to know the one true God. So here in verse three, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandment. This is how we know we have eternal life because we're walking in obedience to him. Perfect obedience? No. Verse one says, but if anyone does sin, not perfect obedience. Okay. Verse four, whoever says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. This is similar to what we read in first John chapter three which said that uh, this is how we know who the children of God and the children of the devil are. Those that practice righteousness are of God. Those that practice sin are of the devil. So whoever walks in sin, remember we looked at what sin was. Sin is transgression of the law, and, it, and sin is lawlessness. Okay, Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, a liar is, true, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, that is, who keeps his commands, Truly has the love of God been perfected in him. By this we know we are in him. This is how we know that we're abiding in Jesus Christ. Just as he told us in John chapter 15, verse 10. John chapter 15, verse 10, he said, uh, if, if, you, uh, abide in, or if you obey my commandments, you will abide in my love. Okay? By this we know that we are in him because we abide in his commandments. This is saying the same thing that Jesus taught. So John the Apostle right here is just parroting the words of Jesus Christ as he spoke them in John chapter 15, verse 6. Whoever says he remains in him ought to walk as he walked. Okay, now here's a question. Because in 1 John chapter 3, when we read verse 4, Whoever practices sin breaks the law, for sin is lawlessness. Those in the Hebraic roots camp will say, the law here is the law of Moses. Whoever breaks the law uh, of Moses, then they are sins against sins by breaking the law of Moses. Okay, well, that would mean that all Christians that don't keep Sabbath, all Christians that don't keep the dietary laws, and all the other unique laws that were given to the people of Israel, if they do not keep them, then they are sinning. And we also read in chapter 3, so right now I, I'm, I'm wanting to appeal to those that are leaning towards the Hebraic roots movement, that are leaning towards this idea that we must obey the Old Testament law, okay? If that's so, follow it to its logical conclusion. And some people indeed have followed it to the logical conclusion, okay? If sin is breaking the law of Moses, okay, then it goes on and says uh, in, verse, in verse 8, whoever practices sin is, or verse... Uh, yeah, verse, da, 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 da. verse 9. Whoever has been born of God does not practice sin. So that means whoever has been born of God continues to walk in the law of Moses. This would mean that you must say, if you're in the Hebraic Roots camp and that you believe that sin is breaking the law of Moses, you must believe that every Christian that does not uh, keep the law of Moses, Sabbaths, new moons, festivals, uh, everything that is in the law of Moses that is, is unique to that law, if they do not keep those things, the dietary laws, then they are in sin and they could not be a child of God. 
So please take that to heart and understand that very clearly. Now, for us, we are able to understand, know clearly the sin, the, the law we know from the New Testament is the law of Jesus Christ. And in future videos, God willing, we'll get into and point out exactly how they are different. But here, we're just going with the fact that in 1, John, or 1 Corinthians 9, it told us so that they were two different laws. Okay, so this is the law of Jesus Christ. But then, those in the Hebraic Roots camp will also come back over here and go to verse 6, chapter 2, verse 6. Whoever says he remains in him ought to walk as he walked. And then, they will give this logic. They'll say, well, how did Jesus walk? Well, Jesus walked as a Jew keeping the law of Moses. And since he kept the law of Moses, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the festivals, the dietary laws, since he kept those things, we must walk even as he walked. And they will make a connection between 1 John 3, 4 and 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. And they'll say, so we also must keep the law of Moses. First of all, this is what Paul was writing against. This is what the Acts chapter 15, the whole argument and debate was about, to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses for Gentiles. They met to discuss this, and their conclusion was, no, the Gentiles do not have to keep the law of Moses. Okay? So, but here, how would we defend against this idea? Whoever says he remains in him ought to walk as Jesus walked. Okay, well, oh, that means he kept the Sabbath, he kept the new moon, so then we must walk in that way. Well, if that's the case, we could say he lived near the Sea of Galilee and ate fish almost every day. And so if we want to walk as Jesus walked, we should eat fish almost every day. Also, Jesus didn't wear, you know, Nikes or Adidas or any sort of, you know, tennis shoe. He wore sandals. And so therefore, we must walk as he walked. Well, walk, yeah, especially because walk as he walked. How did he walk? What kind of shoes did he wear? We should walk in that type of way. Also, Jesus did not uh, drive in a car. He did not use a phone. And so we should not do any of the things that he did not do. Okay, so we see that the logic breaks down at that point, that when it says to walk as Jesus walks, it doesn't mean do everything in exactly the same way he did, in the same culture he had, in the same surroundings and all in the historical situation. No, it does not. What does it mean then? We see what it means if we flip over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Okay, we're supposed to be imitators of God. How? By following Christ. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So how are we to walk? We're to walk like Jesus walked. We're to imitate Jesus Christ. How did he walk? He walked in love. So going back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. Whoever says he remains in him ought to walk as he walked. Does John say this elsewhere? Yes, he said that at the end of 1 John chapter 3. He said, uh, verse 10, in this... The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed. Whoever does not live in righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. He could have said, nor is the one who does not walk as Jesus walked. He walked in love and gave himself as a ransom for us to God. And so we need to understand that the passage is not telling us to go back and obey the law of Moses. As Christians, we are not under the law of Moses. We are under the law of Jesus Christ. We are obligated to obey that. We don't have to obey that perfectly because just like in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, did they have to keep the law of Moses perfectly? No, they did not. This is why whenever they touched an unclean thing or, or they, something was unclean about them, you know, they, they had a funeral for their, their brother and they touched the dead body and they were unclean, they went, they offered sacrifices, they were cleansed in the temple, and then they were brought back into fellowship. In the New Covenant, in the Old Covenant though, people, if they committed murder, was there a sacrifice they could make? No, there was no sacrifice they could make. If there was... Uh, you know, if they committed adultery, was there a sacrifice they could make? No, they had no sacrifice. They were to be stoned to death. But if we flip over here, let's go ahead and go to uh, Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, we see something very important here. I'm just making a side point for us here. Let's see. Okay. Uh, chapter 13, verse 38. Therefore, brothers, let it be known to you that through this man forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is justified from everything from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So there were things in the law of Moses that there was no sacrifice for, adultery, murder. There was no sacrifice that you could offer from those things. The punishment was death, okay? There was other things that did have sacrifices. But in the new covenant, if we flip back over to 1 John, in the New Covenant, 
We are walking with a perfect sacrifice. Jesus died not only so that we could be cleansed in the flesh, but it says that he cleansed our spirit. Let's go ahead and look in Hebrews. So we see Paul's point reiterated here in Hebrews chapter 9. Paul's point from Acts chapter 13. In verse 15, for this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant since, uh, let's see, oh, let's go back a little bit. Uh, verse 11, but Christ, when he came as a high priest of the good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of the heifer, sprinkling the unclean sacrifices so that the flesh is purified, so that the flesh is purified, that, so that if we touched a dead body, then we could offer a sacrifice and a cleansing and go back be in the temple. Uh, the flesh is, sac is, is purified, how much more, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this reason, he is a mediator of a new covenant since the death has occurred for the redemption of sins that were committed under the first covenant so that those who are called might receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. So, after reading this, I turn, I push pause for a minute for the, uh, for the loud motorcycle in the neighborhood. Uh, but we see here that Jesus, he offered a sacrifice that could cleanse us and cleanse us perfectly from sin. Not only the sins of ceremonial things like touching a dead body, but even from things like murder, from adultery, that we can come back to him. So in the new covenant, just like in the old covenant, when they would break the law, they had a sacrifice they could go back and be restored to the temple. In the same way, Whenever we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. We have the, Jesus Christ the righteous seated at the right hand of God, making intercession for us, and we can come before that throne of grace to receive mercy. It says in Hebrews chapter 4, we receive mercy. That means the forgiveness of what we sin. This is why every day we're commanded to pray, Our Father uh, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Uh, no, I already skipped over it. It says, forgive us our debts, even as we forgive our debtors. And so we're, we're commanded to pray this, by Jesus, he told us how to pray because every day we need to ask for the forgiveness of sins. This doesn't mean we only pray the Lord's Prayer, but the point is is that uh, daily we can come and ask for our daily bread. We can also ask for daily forgiveness. For, so a Christian doesn't walk in perfection, just like in the Old Testament they didn't walk in perfection. In the law itself, there was incorporated sacrifices so that people could be back restored back to fellowship in the temple. And so whenever somebody was a leper and they were cleansed, there were certain rules that they could go. They could offer certain sacrifices, do some ceremonial washings, and they could be inspected by the priest. And then they could be brought back into fellowship in the temple and the worship of God. In the same way, in the Christian life, when we're going to uh, worship God and we realize that we have something against our brother, we go to our brother, we make it right, we ask forgiveness from God, and then... That, that's cleansed, that's washed, that's forgiven. And so in the new covenant, there's also a sacrifice built in that we don't have to walk in perfection, but whenever we fail, we come to the throne of grace, we receive mercy, but we also receive grace to help in time of need. Grace is the empowering so that we don't have to continue to walk in that. So we don't only pray, forgive me for my sin, but we also say, Lord, lead me not to temptation, but deliver me from evil. So we have both mercy and grace, empowering grace to give us victory. And so we need to understand that the Christian life, we do have a law, but our idea that having a law means that if you fall, then immediately you're cut off from God and you're out of the covenant and you need to rejoin the covenant. No, when somebody touched a dead body or when somebody broke uh, one of those laws in the Old Testament, it doesn't mean that they were no longer an Israelite, that they were no longer in covenant with God. No, it just means that there was an issue that they needed to deal with in order to go back into the temple. And the same thing with us. If we sin, if we transgress against God's command, then we need to humble ourselves. We need to confess our sin before the Lord. We need to receive forgiveness. That doesn't mean that we're out of covenant and the blood of Jesus doesn't cleanse us. As it says in uh, 1 John chapter 1, it says that, we, uh, that if we walk in the light, as he is in light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So as we walk in this covenant fellowship with God, then we're cleansed from sin. It's like in a marriage. A marriage is a covenant just like the New Testament is a covenant. So in a, in a marriage covenant, if somebody... Uh, if the husband and wife get in an argument and the husband sleeps on the couch, that doesn't mean that they're divorced. Now, it's true if they were refuse to humble themselves, if they grow in bitterness and they just begin to go two different ways and live separate lives, even though they live in the same house, then they're just as equal to divorce because they're no longer walking in that marriage covenant. But it doesn't mean that because they, because he slept on the couch for a couple nights that their marriage was dissolved and they have to get remarried again. In the same way, 
if we sin against the Lord and, and then we come back to him, it doesn't mean that while, before we came back to him, we were, you know, we were going to go to hell if we died. No, we were still in covenant with the Lord. But if we refuse to humble ourselves, if we refuse to confess our sin and come back and receive grace and forgiveness, then our hearts will become hardened by sin and we will walk away from the living God. This is the teaching of the new covenant. So in the new covenant, we do have a law. And we do need to walk according to it, but perfection is not required. Just like the Old Testament law had sacrifices built into the system, now in the New Covenant, we have a better sacrifice built into that. I think I'm going to go ahead and stop it here for today, and then we'll pick up where we left off in the next video. Uh, I hope this has been helpful to you as we go through and understand that Christians indeed have a law. It's not the law of Moses, and we're not lawless, but we do have a law. It's the law of Jesus Christ, and we'll get more into that in the next video. God bless.